Okay, let's wrap a few things up and kind of end our, our circuits one course by looking at a few final notes on complex power, just a few things to keep in mind. Okay, first of all, just want to reiterate that conservation of power works with complex power the same way it did with DC power at the beginning of the course. So, for any circuit, the sum of all the complex powers must be equal to zero. And therefore, the sum of all the real powers must be equal to zero, and the sum of all the reactive powers must be equal to zero as well. So this is always a way to check to make sure your solutions make sense. Complex power should always zero out when you add everything in, sources plus load. Second, when you are adding complex powers together, you want to be careful you do it correctly when you sum them together. So for example, let's say you've got two loads connected in parallel. Let me redraw this a little bit differently. So I've got a source and I've got one load here and one load here. So this is S1, this is S2. And you're given the following. For this one you're told that S1 is equal to 1414 at a phase angle of 45 degrees volt amperes and S2 is equal to 1000 at a phase angle of minus 36.87 degrees volt amperes. So you're given this and you're asked, what is the total apparent power for this system, for these two loads together? So here's a common mistake. People look at this and say, well, by inspection, the apparent power of S1 is 1414 VA. The apparent power of S2 is equal to 1000 volt amperes. And therefore, the total for both must be equal to 2414 volt amperes. Lots of people will do this, summing these together. Problem is that's incorrect. You can't add complex powers this way, or you can't add apparent powers, not in polar form. So in this case, S1, convert this to rectangular form, will be equal to 1000 plus J1000 VA. S2 will be equal to 800 minus J600 VA. So now if I want to add those two complex powers together, I'm going to add the real plus the imaginary part. So S total is therefore equal to 1800 plus J400 volt amperes, which will then be equal to 1844 at a phase angle of 12.53 degrees volt amperes. So therefore, the total apparent power is not just by summing the apparent power values together. Nope, the apparent power is actually 1844 volt amperes. So notice how I need to go, needed to go through and calculate these in rectangular form. Beware of trying to add the values together of the apparent powers in polar form. You won't get the right answer. Okay, so watch out for that. And of course I can add together as many loads as I wanted to across the source and simply sum them together in rectangular form. And then if I then added the complex power of the source itself, I better get z the answer of zero when I add all those complex powers together. All right. Another thing to keep in mind is that you may be 
given, well, I should say complex power can be expressed in different ways. Complex power is equal to the apparent power times the power factor plus J times the apparent power times the reactive factor, as we've already seen, which is equal to P plus JQ. And so you will quite often see complex power expressed in different ways. You may see it expressed in terms of P and Q, or you may see it expressed in terms of the apparent power and the power factor. The point is, is given these equations, no matter what two parameters I'm given, you should be able to fill in the rest of the gaps. So I could even be given, for example, the reactive factor and the apparent power, and I should be able to work backwards and figure out what P is from that, once again, just by using these equations. So you may be given, uh, complex power may be expressed in different ways, depending upon the load and the problem you're working. But always remember, you can plug into these formulas and work backwards and figure out what any of those values are. Finally, one point I want to go over is this. And here's something that I always like to throw out to everybody. When we've been working all of these problems, I've always made it easy on myself. I've been working these problems assuming that the source has a phase angle of zero. So I'd give Vm at a phase angle of zero for the source when I went through and did my complex power calculations. Well, does it need to be zero? Actually, it could be any value. We could pick any arbitrary value. But the question is this. Does the value, does the complex power of the load depend upon the phase angle of that source? Well, if you think about it, why should it? Phase angle is kind of an arbitrary thing. We pick a point on the time axis and we say, this is where we're going to start measuring zero degrees. So to a certain extent, to a very, in fact, to a complete extent, the phase angle is really just kind of a number we pick out of the air. It's kind of arbitrary. It's relative to something we pick. So does it really matter? That's a good question. Let's, let's check this and prove to ourselves whether or not this matters. Instead of this being zero degrees, I want to assume that we've got a phase angle of theta for the source. And in this case, I'm going to have a load current IL flowing around this. I've got a load impedance of ZL, and I'm going to assume that ZL is just equal to, in polar form, ZM at a phase angle of phi. So let's do some calculations here. In this case, IL is just going to be equal to VM over a phase angle of theta divided by ZM at a phase angle of phi which is just going to be equal to Vm over Zm times theta minus phi. So I've just done this, I've just basically gone through and just used, in polar form, just did very simple calculation of this. Okay, well if this is the case, that means that the complex conjugate of IL is equal to Vm over Zm at a phase angle of minus V plus theta, flipping the sign of the phase angle. And therefore, the complex power of the load, SL, must therefore be equal to Vm at a phase angle of theta degrees times IL complex conjugate, VM over ZM times minus theta plus V. And once again, just doing a little math with polar forms, this will be equal to VM squared over ZM times theta minus theta plus phi times phi. And there's my answer. This is the complex power of the load. Notice, 
The only phase angle that matters is the phase angle of the load. The theta disappears from our calculation. So as it turns out, if we have only one source driving a load, then the phase angle can be totally arbitrary. We'll still get the same value of complex power. So that's why we pick zero degrees. Because it could be any value, but zero just makes the math easier. Now obviously if you have multiple sources, then phase angle matters because phase angle is going to tell you what the, sh the shift is between the different sources themselves. But for a single source, it doesn't matter. So the kind of problems we've been working, assuming, for example, power coming out of the wall, we model that as a single generator, then really you can pick any arbitrary value of phase angle for that single source. Okay? That wraps up circuits one. We've covered everything starting from DC circuits all the way through linear circuit theory, nodal mesh analysis, first order RL and RC problems, phasers, and now finally wrapped up with AC power. So this gives you a good fundamental basis on how to do circuit analysis. And in fact, as I promised at the beginning of the course here, what this really gives you is the same kind of tools that the people who designed all of your electronic equipment have. Net mesh and nodal analysis, this is exactly what they do. So all the, all, the people, all the engineers have that design your equipment have over you is they have experience. They have more practice doing this stuff. But the techniques I've showed you are exactly the kind of techniques they use. All right? Good luck, and uh, hope I'll see you in some more advanced courses later on.